All right, I think then we will kick off. So warm welcome and thank you everybody for joining tonight for our event. Solidarity is more than a slogan. International Workers Aid during and after the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina, 92 till 95. Um, warm welcome from our side, um, from the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung's Brussels office. My name is Axel Ruckert. And I'll guide you through this evening tonight together with my colleague, Alexandra Spät. And we're looking forward um, to our study presentation and panel discussion. Tonight, we will address a question that some of us might have asked each other or ourselves um, at one point already. And the question of how to practice solidarity with those who experience war and armed conflict. And how can such solidarity be practiced in, in very practical terms? Um, what form of solidarity is actually helpful and with whom to solidarize? And how can we organize it across borders? How can we organize it democratically? And we want to look at these questions tonight through the perspective of international workers aid. And we don't want to do so by idealizing or rom romanticizing this endeavor, this experience, um, but look at it as, as one, one uh, international workers aid a member actually described it um, as an experiment, as an attempt to practice solidarity. Um, and I'm very excited um, to do so with our wonderful panelists and speakers that we've uh, invited tonight. And I'll briefly introduce them um, before I'll give you, or um, at the same time, I'll give you an idea of uh, what we'll be doing tonight um, before I come to some technical announcements. So first of all, I would like to um, welcome Nicolas Moll. Um, Nicolas, you're a historian by profession living in Sarajevo, and you've written um, this great um, study that we're actually launching tonight. We've just published it on our website, so it's basically experiencing a live launch event. Um, Alexandra will post it, um, the link to our website in the chat. Um, here already, a big thank you, Nicolas, for writing, for composing this study um, and for all the work you've put into it. And we'll be discussing with you about the study in a few minutes. Um, next, I'm really excited um, to introduce our three panelists. Um, first of all, uh, Franziska Bachmann. Franziska, you are joining us from Berlin tonight. Um, you've been actually 18 years old when you joined International Workers Aid, and you've been one of the first volunteers working in um, IWA's Tuzla office. So really excited to hear from your firsthand experience um, when uh, being an active member of International Workers Aid. Um, the same goes for Ulf Andersen. Ulf, you've been um, a member of, uh, of IWA and you were a co-founder of the Swedish International Workers Aid branch. And we're also very excited um, to hear from your experiences, from your firsthand experiences. And last but not least, um, very well welcome uh, to Leila Maidancic. Um, very pleased to have you here with us tonight and to hear your perspective um, as a Tuzla resident. I'm joining us from Tuzla tonight um, and also during International Workers Aid um, time you've been head of the International Students Union in Tuzla. So we will first hear from Nicolas and um, discuss the study and then we'll go into a discussion with Francisca, Ulf, and Leila. Um, but you are, of course, very much welcome to share questions, comments, um, and remarks in our Q&A box. And please use uh, the Q&A box that you find in the Zoom bar below um, for questions. We'd like to reserve the chat um, for sharing links, making announcements. So please um, share your questions in the Q&A box. And we would like really like to encourage you to do so because when we will um, talking later on, we want to get into a conversation um, also with you and are very keen um, to hear from you. If you have any technical problems, um, please don't hesitate to write to Alexandra or me in the private chat using the chat function you also find in the bar below. All right. Before I hand over to Andreas Thomsen, head of our Brussels office, of the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung's Brussels office, um, for a welcome. Um, quick question to Alexandra. Did I forget anything really important, any announcements that we have to make? Perfect. 
All right. Um, and we're recording this session. Um, we will put it down on YouTube channel later on. Um, yeah, if you have an issue with your name appearing when we, for example, talk about the Q&A later on, um, then please let us know and we'll take care of that. All right, then again, warm welcome. Great that you're all here. And I hand over to Andreas. Yeah, um, I'm also very glad that you're all here and that we have the opportunity to uh, to have this uh, launch event of this of this study and publication. And I um, make this very briefly, but uh, uh, basically, I want to uh, I want to say thank you to some to some people being involved in uh, uh, um, developing and in the end publishing the uh, uh, the study. Um, and this is um, quite also a, a story which is uh, in many ways a bit similar, uh, like uh, International Workers Aid worked. Then it had it had to do with uh, some coincidences, and um, it began for me. It began with the meeting in Tuzla some years ago, and I had a feeling um, there's still a story to be told, and there's still um, many. Uh, uh, um, um, there, there are still many discussions we, ca we can have in, uh, uh, um, about the experience of international workers aid and to approach. Uh, so I, I met with Ulf and Ulf so is the first person I would, I would like to thank here. I met with Ulf in, in Sweden and uh, uh, we, were, we were speaking about the beginning of, of international workers aid. He's really an expert in, in that. Um, and basically also he was saying, yeah, and this is, this is uh, what we can say, but you have to speak to Ulrik, who's the next important address. And um, I didn't uh, actually reach out for Ulrik uh, this time since Ulrik uh, uh, came to me and said, we have this uh, archives of uh, Mick Woods and uh, Søren Sandergaard. Uh, and they are decomposing since they are all on, on paper. And this was the first uh, thing we did. We uh, digitalized them, uh, um, we brought them to Berlin and then we had a lot of data and this archives electronically. So the next persons I had to thank here, thank here uh, are obviously uh, Ulrich and uh, Søren also. Um, and then I was uh, sitting in Brussels and I had this data and I was uh, thinking now what we needed, what we, what we really needed uh, was, an, was a historian who maybe uh, uh, has also some knowledge about this time and this region and uh, is interested in the topic. Now, next thing that happened was that Francisca uh, called me one day and told me she incidentally met such an historian with uh, exactly this uh, profile. So thank you very much, Francisca, for making this contact. And I believe this was really uh, more than an incident. And uh, so we met uh, Nicolas, and Nicolas was really the, 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 the perfect match uh, for uh, doing the work on this, uh, on this archives we had. And uh, this in the end, uh, and then uh, thank you very much, Nicolas, as well. Uh, this in the end led to uh, the study and then the publication. And uh, the publication, of course, was uh, uh, um, uh, the publication of a study by, by Nicolas and then carried out. And, and uh, it was a lot of uh, work for, for my colleagues in Brussels. So those are uh, two colleagues I have to thank here as well. And you uh, also see them, uh, Alexander and Axel. Also, thank you very much for moderating, facilitating this, uh, this event. This is the uh, this is the line, like the storyline for this for this study, and I'm extremely glad that uh, uh, that we now managed uh, to uh, uh, um, to finish it, to publish it, and now to launch it. And for me, and for my time also in for my in Brussels office, this is also a ni nice arc of. Uh, um, of work on this uh, on this topic. So this was very briefly, but there were there were obviously a lot uh, more people to thank. Uh, also, uh, Leila for for participating here. Um, I would leave it with that with that and um, um, hand back to uh, Axel, I believe, um, and to move on with the more important information and discussions. It's me. Thank you very much. I'm so sorry. Uh, no problem. Thank you very much. Yeah, we are all very, very, very happy to see that publication published right now. 
Uh, you have written a very comprehensive and insightful study. But before we go into the details, perhaps a very simple question to start with. What is it actually about? Can you summarize what International Workers' Aid was about and what we need to know to understand this experiment, as it was called by the members? Yes, uh, do you hear me? Uh, micro is working, okay. Um, yeah, thanks, so hi everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm really also very happy to be here to uh, see the, the book finished after this long journey and Andreas uh, told uh, some of the steps and, um, and uh, I really also want to thank Andreas, Axel and uh, Alexandra yeah, for making this book possible and now organizing this lounge. And I see now the, the list of names, so it's great to see names uh, that I know, but it's also great to see names which I don't know. So uh, hopefully also exactly this is also um, a story which will um, yeah, yeah, be more known than it is now. And uh, actually, yeah, that's a little bit uh, also come to come to your question, Alexandra. Um, um, I mean, I also didn't know much about International Workers Aid or nearly nothing three, four years ago. And then by this coincidence meeting Franziska, et cetera, this, what Andreas told, I discovered uh, this initiative, also a very rich uh, material which was left and which really, and I met uh, many of the different uh, former activists. And, um, and I was wondering also, I mean, how come that it's uh, not so much known? Um, and. Uh, and uh, actually, it's not the only initiative from the 90s which was very committed uh, towards Bosnia Herzegovina, which is not known. But there have been a lot of lot, thousands and thousands of individuals in different European countries which were engaged. Um, but actually, these solidarity mobilizations are not very much known in, in general in Europe today, except for those who participated in it. Uh, but in general, it's not a topic uh, which many. Um, uh, know about and uh, I mean there are different reasons for it I think one of the reasons is certainly also that the dominating picture about the attitude of Europe and the international community towards Bosnia during the war is indifference passivity so uh, the world is looking uh, but not doing anything concerning all the violence um, uh, in Bosnia Herzegovina and the war and the politics of ethnic cleansing and in the same time so I think it's true, yes, there have been this passivity, this indifference or complicity even on the side of many of the governments. But actually, at the same time, there have been all these solidarity mobilizations uh, on the grassroots level, um, which have been uh, developing and, uh, yeah, which are probably also suffering a little bit from this general picture of indifference. But actually, all these people who were engaged in these groups uh, also very often were very critical towards their own governments and said, we have to do something uh, to, to show uh, support, to show solidarity, et cetera, et cetera. And um, yeah, so as I said, International Workers' Aid was not the uh, only initiative, but I think, um, um, and it would be worth to make a study of each of these initiatives, of course. I mean, uh, um, but I think, uh, except the coincidences which led also to, to make this uh, study now, I think there are also good reasons uh, to have chosen International Workers Aid for this study. Because I think in this field of all these solidarity mobilizations, it is in the same time an organization which reflects different tendencies, but is also very original in itself. And there are several factors which come together. So, so what is International Workers Aid? International Workers Aid is a group of um, people mainly from the political left can be socialists, anarchists, uh, uh, syndicalists, Trotskyists, people also who don't define themselves uh, in a category, but uh, who basically um, say at one moment, yes, we cannot stay indifferent, we have to do something, yeah, and um, uh, it's a process which was there for many persons, so some went into actions after not, so for International Workers' Aid, basically, um, it was uh, something um, which was triggered also by uh, knowing about the, uh, the uh, fate of the town of Tuzla in northern Bosnia, because there were uh, Tuzla as a miners' town, as an industrial town, uh, actually 
was very strong also um, in, in experiences of international solidarity also in the 80s and before. And actually Tuzla in a certain way um, uh, embodied all the values uh, the people who then joined under international workers aid wanted to support. Yeah, a multi-ethnic city, a worker city, industrial city, fighting against all nationalisms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think this was one specificity. There have been other groups which focused on Tuzla, but many of the international attention also of solidarity groups was on Sarajevo, yeah, uh, so not so much on, on Tuzla, so that was perhaps one of the specificities to say let's do something. Another specificity um, is, I mean, there have been many humanitarian groups who helped, there have been many political groups who uh, supported in one way, and there have been those who combined both, so how to combine humanitarian and political work, and international workers aid was one of those who tried to combine both. So we bring food, yeah, because uh, Tuzla in 93 was starving, yeah. Uh, we bring food uh, to this city of miners. We, but actually, yes, we wanted to link it with a political message. So we just don't want to just bring it and then distribute it in general. No, our target are really the miners there who are defending the city, who are embodying the spirit of the city. And so, um, uh, the contact cooperation was established with the trade unions, coal miners trade union in, in, in Tuzla. And the idea was really to strengthen those who are defending this idea of a multi-ethnic uh, Bosnia Herzegovina and the miners and the workers' rights, uh, etc. So that's another, I think, this link of political and humanitarian um, aid. Um, and once again, also other groups did it, but here specifically also on uh, uh, combining trade unions, syndicalists, activists uh, from Western Europe and then uh, from uh, Tuzla. And the third uh, aspect, which is quite original, many of the other initiatives which existed, uh, who tried to support Bosnia Herzegovina in one way or the other, were very mononational. I mean, it was a group in France who did great things, uh, for example, for Sarajevo or for Tuzla, or there was a group in, in Germany, in Austria, but there were not so much groups which really try to have an international approach. And this is really International Workers' Aid, as the name says, it, it uh, was really grouping at least groups from 10 different countries in Europe. Yeah, so to try to, um, and, uh, and to try find ways how to work together. Because in a certain way, they said also, I mean, yeah, it was the idea also uh, to, um, believing in a, in a Europe or in an international soli solidarity um, which they embodied in themselves also. And this international cooperation, so between people from Sweden, from Denmark, from Belgium, from France, Germany, Austria, Italy, Spain, uh, Switzerland, uh, and I forgot uh, certainly now two or three. Yeah, this I think it's also very, this is probably even the most specific aspect, but I think these three things together, yeah, focusing, focusing on Tuzla, linking political and humanitarian aid, and especially also with this idea of supporting miners um, and trade unions, uh, and then this international approach, I think this, this makes really this, uh, um, makes it worth to make out of international workers aid an object of study by itself. Yeah. Uh -uh. So perhaps I can show also some, um, because for the studies of it, I mean, you can, uh, Alexander already shared the link, um, but so just to give you an idea how the study looks like, um, and, um, <clears throat> and also, yeah, so here you see it, that's the, uh, the, the front page and uh... yeah, maybe, maybe I can just interrupt because um, that concerns my second question um, and yeah. you, you already answered it but maybe just again very precisely uh, you have chosen the slogan solidarity is more than a slogan as the title of the study can you explain where this expression comes from and why you have chosen it yes um yeah, actually, it's a quote uh, from a film which was made about the very first convoy of trucks uh, which came from uh, Western uh, Europe uh, to Tuzla in 1993. So there's a documentary movie, which I uh, quote also in my uh, book, which is made by an Australian um, uh, photographer and filmmaker who was actually part of this very first convoy in 1993. Yes, and this is a... Uh, 
Um, and in this uh, documentary movie, actually at one moment there's this quote and uh, what we did showed that solidarity is more than a slogan. And I think uh, for me, it was something which also embodied also a little bit the spirit um, uh, of international workers aid, of course, also of other groups, but that's why I think also it's a, uh, where international workers aid is so interesting because it reflects also many other groups. Yeah. So the idea, okay, on the one hand, you can sit in London, in Copenhagen, in Paris or in uh, uh, wherever and say, Bosnia has to be defended or um, the war has to stop, yeah? But the other thing is, um, yeah, if you remain just in your, at home or um, it, uh, I mean, it is better than nothing to say this, but it's nevertheless also not really helping or supporting or doing something concretely. So basically also this idea, yeah, what can we do that solidarity does not remain a slogan, yeah, but becomes more, becomes really a practice. And I think this I tried also to show in the study, I mean, uh, how to transform solidarity from an idea in a practice. And that's super complicated. I mean, this is uh, super challenging and, uh, and it's in general challenging, but if you do it by going into a war, war zone as in Bosnia Herzegovina between 92 and 95, it's of course even more challenging and difficult. And I, I quote one, at one moment in my book also Mick Woods, who was one of the pioneers of uh, international workers aid. So he was in the very first convoy as a driver and then continued, made more than 20 uh, convoys uh, to, to Tuzla. And he says at one moment after the war, he made this quote, yeah, um, uh, saying, yeah, it's what I just said also. It's on the one hand, yeah, it's easier to, 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 to make some slogans, but it's much more complicated uh, to go away from just from the slogan and then put your life at risk, yeah, of course, by going into a war zone. And then also, basically, also with what International Workers Aid did was also very, how to say, um, a lot of totally annoying things to be done. I mean, all the administrative paperwork which needed to be done to get a truck into Bosnia-Herzegovina. But also, I mean, uh, International Workers Aid, uh, which was not, uh, had not very much money, acquired free trucks at the beginning. And uh, these were two older uh, former trucks from the Eastern German army, uh, which actually were old models. And of course, so they had to be repaired uh, basically every second day or were falling apart and you had to get the spare parts. So organizing all this solidarity was extremely um, yeah, annoying in a certain way or exhausting in different ways. And then I think also the, the most difficult part in solidarity is of course this human social part. And this was also something what um, I think what uh, uh, International Workers Aid experienced itself. Um, so how can we do, because delivering food to others is of course creating a hierarchical, hierarchical uh, situation or relation yeah you bring food to people who are starving or who need food or uh, who don't have enough food so you are cre creating in a certain way not a symmetric um, um, uh, relationship so but then it becomes very dangerous yeah because you can what about the dignity of those who are in this situation of war and who are in need yeah so how can you respect this dignity and these were questions which were very important for the different persons of international workers. And I think uh, the book tries also to show us how they reacted to very practical questions. So I think one, um, uh, just to, to give one example to show also what was the approach of international workers aid was to say, when we bring the food to Tuzla, we don't want to distribute it ourselves. Yeah, we want really to give it to the trade unions and they distribute it among the miners because we don't want to make the trade unions superfluous. We want to strengthen them, yeah? And if we come and give the food directly to the miners, then it changes everything. Basically, we are bypassing the trade unions. We are putting us in a situation of force and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this was something 
uh, international workers who didn't want to do. Yeah, so they wanted to empower in a certain way the trade unions. In the same time, this was also not easy because, of course, also in a in a war situation, you have a problem of black market, etc., where everything is scarce. Uh, so there were soon also rumors of coming up uh, that uh, some of the food brought to. Uh, Tuzla ended up on the black market. So how do you react to, to that? Yeah. So how do you um, um, uh, and so uh, yeah, how do you react to all these challenges? And to bring a last challenge, which is not directly linked only to the question of solidarity, but in general, it's it's very practical challenges all the way long in this in this work is. Um, um, for example, yeah, very concrete question. So there were uh, some uh, European community sponsored organizations and one day they gave a lot of material food, food uh, to international workers aid. And actually many in international workers aid didn't like the European community because they thought that it's a capitalist enterprise. So suddenly you have a very concrete question. What do we do with the food donated by this, we had the 12 stars of it because we don't want to make propaganda for the European uh, community. But in the same time, it's food. I mean, people are waiting for food. So should we throw it away? What should we do with it? So these are all kinds of questions which appear all the time. And this is what I tried also to, 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 to show in the study, actually, yeah, this, uh, all these practical challenges on very different levels and what kind of answers uh, international workers I try to find, yeah. So perhaps just to show, um, now I'm, um, so you see the, so why can't I go down now? Um, oops, strange. So you still see the, the front page? Okay, um, wait, I will try to find another way. I'll stop. Hello, I'm back. Um, uh -um. So I knew that something like that would happen. Um, let's try again. Yes. There is no proper Zoom event without a technical failure. So we're I'm... just checking boxes here. <laughs> ah, now it scrolls down, perfect. So here you see, just to give an idea about the structure of a book and then uh, you can discover it, of course, by your own. So basically it has two big parts because the idea was on the one hand to tell the story. Yeah, so basically to do the work of a historian. And then, but also there have been so much documents, yeah, because really, I mean, as Andreas mentioned, the archives of Mick Boots, but also the archives of others, and, uh, which uh, many of the former uh, members of EVA shared with me. And it was it's, it's such a great experience anyway, as a historian to, to touch original archives. And I mean, as uh, Andreas mentioned, it's, um, it's paper and it's not only paper, most of it is fax paper because in the 90s, of course, most of the communication went by fax. And those who remember fax, it's, you know, it's, it's very, uh, <laughs> this paper, which is falling apart. I mean, to read some documents 20 years later is quite a challenge. But so it, nevertheless, it's to discover these archives, etc. it was clear that um, it's uh, the book should also include really reproductions of facsimiles because making a facsimile of a fax which you can't read anymore would be a little bit difficult. So to reproduce uh, things. So you see actually it comes at the end documentation but basically it's half of a book are original documents from the time which are reproduced so that uh, next to the historical narrative and my interpretation which I give there are also really original voices and original uh, aspects who are uh, who are coming. So basically, um, as you see, um, you you have these uh, different parts um, here. Also at the beginning, it was important to put a map. So thank you also to Irfan Salihagic in Sarajevo who made this map, yeah, because uh, to show also the different. Uh, those who are not so familiar with Bosnia Herzegovina and to understand also the, the military situation and to show as you see also the, the route, uh, the convoys, most of the convoys took um, and that it had to go 
through different territories controlled by different armies and of course each one time was meaning checkpoints and all the problems bringing with the checkpoints um so yeah you have yeah these different uh, chapters so first I, it's in a chronological approach yeah and uh, you see also i want to thank also melanie hendrich who made the great design of uh, the study also and also all the former eva members who gave me photos because all the photos you see in the book are really photos which have been taken by uh, uh, persons from eva during their activities in a certain way yeah and so you have this um, this structure uh, where you see so in different um, uh, this chronological order um, in uh, within this text part I have written and so that's and what is also important I mean you know many NGOs or other organizations once that the war ended decided to go away again but actually Eva was one of those who said we staying yeah we there are still things to do it's not because the war are over that the problems are over so. This is the chapter, yeah, how to continue in post-war Bosnia-Herzegovina, because of course the situation is not the same. So the question is, food convoys now, does it make sense? No, so we should invent something else. Yeah, so um, this is this part. And um, yeah, I mean, the international workers aid lasted from 93 until 2000. So as I write also in a book in the journal, you can say it's perhaps not very long, but these years are hugely important. I mean, even if it was just one year or six months, yeah, but staying seven years for a group of volunteers. I mean, Eva were basically most of the persons or all of the persons were volunteers. Yeah, it was not a professional aid organization. It never wanted to become one. Um, so in a certain way, it was also normal in my view that after a certain time, it just ceased to exist. Yeah? So it didn't end with a bang. It just, yeah, faded out in a certain way. Yeah? So just to show you also, um, so here after I uh, try to summarize in this fifth chapter, yeah, what is it? What is this Eva experience? What is the specificity of it? And uh, also, what are the legacies? Yeah, um, uh, Andreas mentioned that there was a, a meeting of the former Eva members with their friends from Tuzla in Tuzla in 2018. So this talks about about the legacies. Then you have also some annexes, yeah, a chronology. Um, all the different organizations which were part of International Workers' Aid, which I tried to reconstruct uh, through the, all the archival documents, the different activities also um, which were made, and also a little chapter about yeah, what was specific about Tuzla, because I think uh, um, this study is also meant, of course, uh, I'm glad that many former EVA members are there and I'm really looking forward, of course, for their feedback. But of course, it's also especially written for people who have never heard about EVA, who have never heard about Tuzla, who perhaps don't know nothing about Bosnia-Herzegovina, yeah, to explain so also here the context. And just to show so the last part, as I said, the second part is the documentation. Um, and as you see also, the idea was to regroup uh, documents under certain um, categories so that uh, we understand better yeah, what were the political aims, again, the challenges of the convoys, the national campaigns, the local projects, and also the discussions uh, they had, yeah, because there were very controversial discussions about uh, many things within EVA. Should we focus on Tuzla or it's not only on Tuzla? Why not also Sarajevo or Bihaj or others? Yeah? Should we support a military intervention or should we not support a military intervention? Yeah? All questions which many of the groups um, which were engaged were asking themselves, but uh, in EVA you, you can find them. Yeah? And the, the last chapter, I'm also very happy that uh, it is in with voices from Tuzla because it's true that it's written from a perspective, the sources that I have are from persons who were from, once again, from Sweden, from England, from Germany, Austria, Italy, and others, so who were coming to Tuzla. I didn't have much sources from people from Tuzla to see what were their reactions, but so I nevertheless put some uh, of these voices of Tuzla. I want to thank especially also uh, Victoria Musa Juric, uh, who gave me her uh, extracts of her diary, which she wrote as a 14-year-old teenager in Tuzla, and where she met uh, Francisca and other Eva members, and so where she writes uh, uh, also um, her impressions about that. So I think these are 
I uh, wanted to try also to bring in a little bit also these, these reactions uh, from, from Tuzla. Yeah? So you see how it looks like, these different documents, and then also photos coming. Yeah, here a series about the convoys um, and others. So where there's a little appetizer, I hope it gives appetite to look more in the book. And uh, yeah, and just for the end, um, <clears throat> yeah, also a glossary because we thought it's good to have something once again for people who don't know much about Bosnia Herzegovina. So that, uh, yeah, what is Herzeg Bosna? What is, yeah, because I mean, for people who are familiar, they will immediately know what it is. But uh, once again, uh, I think I hope very strongly that uh, this book will also be interesting for people who don't know uh, much about Bosnia Herzegovina, who don't know much about the 90s, but that through this book can learn about it. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, as we could just see, you analyzed a very rich archive of documents, photos, and also personal accounts and exchanged with a lot of different former members throughout your research. Um, so my last question for you, as an historian and also trainer in the field of intercultural cooperation and dealing with the past, living and working in Sarajevo, what's the value of studying and learning about um, the international workers' aid for us today? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I think there are several um, uh, aspects which are important. I think on the one hand, as I said at the beginning, First, it's really, um, I think mm, Bosnia Herzegovina and the war in Bosnia Herzegovina is not very much present in the collective memory or awareness of Europe in general. Yeah, it was already a tendency at that time to say this has nothing to do with us. We uh, so these are these uh, um, violent people who are killing each other. This has nothing to do. And so it was sort of evacuating the war, which was a war in Europe and which was a European war. But of course, it's easier to say it's the Balkans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So and. In the same time, all these people who were engaged, like people from the International Workers' Aid, were exactly also going against this idea. Yeah, No, this is part of our life. This is our society. This is uh, our continent. Uh, this is uh, our values, everything what uh, we cherish, which are under attack and which people in Tuzla and elsewhere are defending. Yeah, so. I think it's, and so these solidarity mobilizations, which are part of the war story, both of them are, uh, so the war is known, yeah, but the solidarity mobilizations are not very much known. So I think the first important aspect is really, yeah, if you want really to understand that uh, Europe is, uh, that uh, Southeastern Europe is really a part of Europe, yeah, like any other part of Europe, these solidarity mobilizations can also perhaps contribute to understand this, yeah, because I think this is really to share and not to, um, to make a separation between them and us, but to bring really a common idea of Europe where everybody um, is, is part of it. And then the other, I mean, there are several aspects, but just to limit it, one other question, which I find, think fundamental for today is, uh, yeah, I mean, once again, uh, it's linked to the title. Solidarity is more than a slogan. I mean, solidarity is such a, um, a task, a challenge, such a difficulty in everyday life. Um, um, it's, it's a question which arouses among so many things. And, um, and yeah, how can you practice solidarity um, in a democratic way, in a way how can you support people who are in, a, in need or who are in a situation of violence, yes, without humiliating them, yeah? Uh, how can you really build, try to build a partnership with them? How can you, uh, yeah, how can you avoid just to stay at home and to say it's important to do this, but in practice to do nothing. So I think that's why I, I hope for those who read it, it's also a trigger 
um, for uh, for thinking about what can I personally do today with others. Um, so it can be for causes in other countries, but it can be in your own country, it can be in your neighborhood. Yeah, just to perhaps to stimulate this reflection. And as I write in the book, of course, what international workers they did, uh, it's not a copy paste, you cannot copy paste it. And also, as you said at the beginning, Axel, it's not to be romanticized or idealized. There are also, of course, there are also critical aspects and I, I talk also uh, about them, but that's part of it. I mean, nobody says yeah. that this was a perfect initiative. I mean, when you do solidarity or when you try to do solidarity, to practice it, it's, as I said at the beginning, it's super complicated, yeah. And, um, so yeah, I, I hope that the, the book can participate at, uh, at this discussion uh, yeah, for, for, for today. Yeah, thank you very much. I would also like to interrupt you because we have such an amazing panel tonight that I would like to give Axel the opportunity to also ask questions to our other guests now. Yes, thank you very much, Alexandra. Thank you, Nicolas. Before we do that, um, there are already a couple of remarks and questions in the Q&A section, which is great. Um, there has been the questions that some participants are really interested in who else is in here. So we have the Zoom webinar format, which is different to the Zoom meeting format. In the meeting format, we could all see each other. Um, but in this format that we've chosen, this is unfortunately not possible. And um, we can also not um, just tell you who is in here. Um, um, because that might not be comfortable for all participants who have joined. So what I suggest, um, the chat should now work for all participants. So um, if you like, you can write in the chat. Um, Hello, I'm Axel joining um, from Brussels tonight. Good to see you all. Um, and I think it would be a nice way for everybody to see who's actually joining in um, from where. So if you want to do that, feel free to use the chat. It should work for that now if you would actually like to make a comment if you actually would like to speak um, this is possible and i think it would be a nice opportunity um, to use this function later on if you would like um, to make a comment by um, switching on your mic um, then i suggest we use another function which you find in the zoom bar below and this is the raise hand function so if you want to participate by saying a few words um, then please click on raise hand and when we open the round um, in a couple of minutes, um, then I will um, yeah, promote you uh, to a speaker and then you can also um, join here and speak and ask your question in person. And otherwise, feel free um, to use the Q&A box for further questions. And we'll also get back to the question regarding websites, documentation and the book um, later on. But first of all, um, I'd like, now to um, yeah, exchange with uh, Francisca Ulf and Leila and to dive deeper into some of the aspects that um, Nicolas has already mentioned and to get deeper into, into these um, aspects and of course also to uh, look at them via your perspective, via the perspective of, of those who have been um, active and, and working on the ground. So Francisca, I'd like to start with you. Um, when I've been reading Nicolas uh, study what I found interesting is, and we talked or heard about that already a lot, the, the question of solidarity. Um, and as Nicolas mentioned already, solidarity, solidarity can mean a lot. Um, and especially when practicing solidarity in the, in the context of human, humanitarian aid, um, it's a delicate balance um, between providing humanitarian aid that is meaningful and helpful for those who are the receiving end um, to, met, to make sure that's not taking away dignity, um, to make sure to build partnerships while doing so. But if I, if I look back at what you've been doing, and if I try to imagine that doing in today's context um, and doing it in very practical terms, I was wondering, okay, how do you actually do that when you work together with partners on the ground? There are different expectations, there are different perspectives you have on, on support, on aid, different needs. Um, so what was your experience on, on balancing these expectations and, and practicing this, this form of solidarity to not make it, um, let's say, a destructive example of humanitarian aid, but really building partnerships and, and um, a meaningful solidarity? Um, 
may want to start out anyway first just to say thank you one more time for Nicolas for writing this book and um, um, very much as um, Andreas has already explained it was actually a good example of how IWA was working um, you know with lots of strange um, coincidences then summing up in something good. Sometimes they ended up in total catastrophes in smaller or bigger catastrophes, but very often also the willingness of us members also to let things go really led to something good, you know? And um, so, yeah, I mean, Nicolas, we didn't know you before and um, I was very happy when I first read the book, I was very touched and then also immediately called Andreas and said, thank you that you actually took the initiative and were pushing um, that this would happen. Um, because um, at least us who have read it already, we really feel that you, um, you understood um, and really picked up the spirit, at least how it was for us working in it. So thank you very much for that. Um, and then uh, going back to your question about uh, what I or what we learned about building lasting partnerships um, and balancing own expectations. Um, it's also pretty much also what um, Nicolas has picked up already. I mean, the way um, we started to work down there was really we also in the like, um, I actually, I'll, maybe if we show this film about the first convoy in the end there, you can also see it, you know, when Jenny, for example, that was typical, the example how we worked when she first arrived with the first convoy to Tuzla, which was to provide humanitarian aid back to the, um, and distributed um, through the mine workers trade union. She met with many different initiatives and she, she was open and she listened to what they wanted and to what their needs was and what their ideas was and that was the basis huh? and that I think um, carried on in most of our project to really be the basis to go there and meet people and really listen to them and their needs and be open towards that um, but at the same time we also um, you know we didn't we didn't have like a hidden political agenda we were very clear and very open about our values and about our ideas but um, there was a great you know acceptance of of other opinions you know and when we went there and met people and when we got ideas from them what campaigns actually we could work about we um you know we were very open you know telling them in what way this would fit also into our ideas and you know, what we could build on things and what we couldn't, you know. Um, and then I think one very important thing was also that most of us, we really, um, we, we try to be really honest also about our possibilities and really not raise fails hopes. And um, people also saw we were really coming back to them, even if campaigns that we wanted to do didn't work out, we were giving them feedbacks about things that went wrong also, you know, and things that didn't happen in the way we wanted and uh, and therefore, you know, try to try to live a bit this equal um, partnership, which of course is never possible to all extent in this, it's just, you know, the, the situation is out of balance, but I think we were trying to, to meet this in the best possible way. Um, and I think it was also, I think our non-hierarchical structure uh, in our organization, it was also very visible, I think also uh, for the people in Tuzla. Um, and you know that also avoided like also maybe more hierarchical feelings also in the partnerships you know they, they didn't see you know these structures within the organization as we were living it um and yeah i mean basically also just yeah i mean apart from um being open and listening to 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 
individuals and structures that we were actually trying to build projects with. It was also a big part also was how we were socialized in Tuzla, the ones who were working there. I mean, we were, we were socialized really with the people from Tuzla and not um, um, among the other, you know, in the communities of the other aid workers. Of course, there was some exchange, but um, I think we were, yeah, it was like, so also outside work, we were just socialized really in Tuzla. And also that, you know, in the evenings also, you know, when it was curfew and we could go around meeting everyone and just listening and just really listening to the very concrete problems that any, everyone had and sharing the small and bigger stories, you know? And when you do that, I think it gets uh, quite easy also to be able to, um, to follow the way of the people that it's actually about and not be, um, you know, not be disappointed if you maybe couldn't push things through sometimes the way you want it because it, you know, when you're in so close touch, you understand, you know, this is not about me, you know, and we're not there <laughs> because of us, but because we want to, you know, do something uh, with and for the people who are actually living there. And um, yeah, I don't know, sometimes it's all <laughs> was also, you know, also funny aspects, like when I arrived there, for example, like it's just in uh, one of these many anecdotes I, you know, I didn't expect, you know, coming to a war zone and the, the most important thing the teenagers I met were talking about it was that Kurt Cobain had died and they all hated Kurt Me Love and her role. <laughs> and I mean, that was the big thing, not the war that was going out on around them and that they were living in. Um, yeah, um, one thing, yeah, I maybe also wanted to pick up the issue with the, the women's paper that we were involved in. That was a project that was already um, towards the first issue, also um, kind of difficult, to, um, also because of um, some rivalry um, among different participants in Tuzla maybe um, also. Um, so already to bring out the first issue was actually um, uh, going quite a long way. And then the, the first issue wasn't really anything that we maybe would have hoped it should be. The balance of contents, um, uh, yeah, was, yeah, as I said, maybe not what we had wished for in the sense that we knew we could use it for campaigning to, uh, you know, gain more money to continue with it. But it was from the women who were doing it in Tuzla. They were proud about the magazine and especially, you know, in the balance of content that it was. And um, then it's also in a way, you know, who are we to say about what, uh, what they should publish in their, in, 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 uh, you know, in the paper, which was really theirs. And, also, of course, I mean, you know, who are we to say maybe in this, you know, in this sickening war and post-war situation, you know, maybe it was more healthy for the individual and um, a bigger relief to read more about uh, Richard Gere than uh, uh, like feminist analysis, okay? And um, that's, I think also, but you know, I think we, we were quite strong also in accepting things. Of course, it also brought limitations to, you know, of course, you know, this was a project as such that we maybe wouldn't continue or couldn't also with the structure of our campaigns at home um, continue to support, but um, yeah. The acceptance that it was from um, whoever was living there and for them doing it for them was, um, you know, balancing out like, you know, disappointments or something. And I, I think, you know, we just saw all the time some campaigns, they went in the way we wished and some didn't. And some were sad, some made us angry, some things we could also really laugh about. I mean, that was also some, you know, we, yeah, we were, we were also looking at the things that were going wrong and 
yeah, didn't have a problem with that as such. And so, yeah, what, what did I learn about it? Or maybe it was more um, that within our work, I, I felt the proof and that's like independent of if you're doing solidarity or political work or actually in, in, in your daily work, whatever, it's just, you know, listen to the people you are working with and put them in the focus and also um, step out of your own reality into the reality of the persons you're working with. And yeah, that's also something that, you know, goes for you know, many other ways. I mean, also, you know, when I was a totally different thing, but when I was biking home today, I also thought, you know, you know, when you, for example, first wrote and suggested this day for the meeting, in my reality, I thought, you know, who on earth would have time on a normal weekday at this time of the day to at all listen to anything like this? And then there is quite many people who have time in this moment. And so, you know, it's always good to um, leave your own reality and look at it from another angle. And that actually counts for all. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, and I think uh, find it interesting what you also mentioned regarding uh, regarding the structures of international workers aid and and how they also influence um, how you actually took decisions and then and then practice solidarity. Yeah, but we'll come to that later. Um, and yeah, you, you just mentioned the reality of those uh, you're working with, the realities uh, of those who, li who are living in Chusla. Um, during these uh, days, and uh, Leila, you raised your hand, and um, yeah, it would be really interesting to hear from you um, yeah. how how this was perceived by by residents in Tuzla, and and what the work of International Workers Aid um, meant for residents in Tuzla, meant for you back then, and um, what your experience was like. Ah, uh, yeah. Hi, I was listening, Francisca, and that was very emotional, and I'm emotional right now. But uh, you know the thing that uh, IWA was listening to us. It came to some bigger projects. It's not. It wasn't only uh, distribution of foods. Uh, it was more than that. Uh, thanks to Francisca, Jenny, uh, Aldegonda, and some others uh, who were listening, students of mining and geology, uh, we realized one project with Vice uh, Life youth solidarity with former Yugoslavia. And uh, it was like a three years project, but at the end, uh, now they are independent at the university and 26 years after that, we still have Sama University at Tuzla. They supported us, they listened to us. We had the chance to go out, one delegation, student delegation went out, uh, make some connection with the, uh, other universities from Western Europe uh, had a chance to bring some uh, uh, professors, students to, to Tuzla, but uh, also very important thing that uh, uh, three years after the first uh, summer university, we had students from Banja Luka in Tuzla as well. Banja Luka was in Republika Srpska, uh, and that was uh, uh, very difficult to bring uh, people who were fighting with each other back together. This summer university helped us and we have it right now. Uh, the one thing is that we have also is uh, uh, doctors, professors who are going abroad and uh, uh, exchanging uh, knowledge with uh, other colleagues. It was really interesting to be in that delegation in 94. Uh, and uh, to discuss with the people in uh, Europe about the situation in Bosnia, when they, at one moment, they, on one uh, meeting, one of the students uh, from uh, Poland asked me uh, why we should support third world countries, although we were in Europe. Uh, that really hurt a lot, but uh, I survived that and I stood up and fight for my country. Uh, but that's all 
thanks to, to my colleagues from IWA and YSY. And thank you guys, I love you. I will talk more, but the moment I cannot really speak, it's, it's really, really difficult. So please, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Yes, yes. Thank you, Laila. Thank you. Thank you for your honest remarks and um, and for sharing your impressions. Um, I find it really touching as well. Um, yeah. Coming coming to another aspect, um, I would like to uh, take off in the in the round here as well. Um, that we that we heard about before, and and Francisca also mentioned it. Um, and, and that's another aspect that I found striking when, when reading Nicola's story, uh, Nicola's study, um, is, and also if I look at it from today's perspective, and if I look at um, what the left is really good at and what the left is not so good at, um, is how, how on earth did you actually manage to come together from so many countries and organize this in very practical terms? And how did you manage decision making and how did you manage to not get stuck on on certain questions that are that are then ideological and that can really really take hours and I guess it, you had these moments of discussing for hours etc but how did you actually manage to overcome them and not to get stuck at a certain point but to move on and solve these questions without breaking apart while still sticking together and still making this move um jointly or how, making this this work um, across borders that I find really um, really interesting it would be great if you can if you can share with us how from your perspective that actually worked out yeah it's a it's a tricky question <laughs> um, and I was quite impressed when I read the <coughs> how Nicholas described our way of working and I've been thinking a lot about this now before this launch of, of, of this book. Um, I think that first of all, it's important to remember at this time in the 90s, the opinion was quite divided. Uh, and in the left wing, you had quite strong forces that, that saw Serbia as a victim for aggression from imperialist powers like Germany and uh, the United States. And that was their main focus in this conflict. Uh, and you also had uh, politicians like John Major in, in UK, and uh, you also had sentiments in France going back to the First World War but when they were allied with Serbia, and of course du during the, the Second World War also. But people who joined IWA had some kind of analysis that this is a struggle between forces who wants a racist Europe where you divide people according to ethnicity uh, and religion. And if you are an anti-racist, anti-fascist back in your own country, uh, you would see the struggle in Tusla against the aggression as part of, of the same struggle. And then, of course, if you have this in common uh, and uh, you can be, be a socialist or uh, anarchist or Trotskyist or, or a syndicalist or, or, or a social democrat, or, and we also had support from one MP from the Christian Democratic Party in Sweden. And if you share these values, uh, then, of course, you have to realize that, okay, you can be seeing European community and, and the, the, the process of, of getting European Union uh, as some kind of, of things that you want to resist, or you can be a left-wing supporter of, of the European Union. But now it's the question about supporting the trade unions 
and the people in Tuzla. So you have to agree to disagree about a lot of questions. And I think that the people who were active in IWA in different countries, they were quite pragmatic. Of course, they had their own beliefs, but they realized that now it's time to go together in this, this solidarity work. And I think that many people also had a, a lot of humor. Uh, they, they were not <laughs> very, of course, they, they had their own firm beliefs, but, but, but they could also accept and respect other opinions. Uh, and I think that we tried all the time to be having a campaign where, where you people should be treated e equally, whether in a, a certain country or in the international campaign. And we had this principle, I, I don't know if it was ever written down, but we should try to make joint decisions by consensus. Uh, so we had these international meetings and long discussions about things and very seldom we had to put a vote or otherwise we, we just use time to, to discuss to, to a joint uh, yeah to, to agreement how, how to handle things. But of course uh, as uh, I think Nicolas mentioned, of course, there were very tricky questions, uh, like you had the bombings from NATO after Srebrenica in uh, Srebrenica was in July '95, and you had the NATO bombings beginning, I think, in end of August and uh, September '95. And I don't think that we ever tried to get a joint uh, view. Or, or, or position about, about the NATO bombings. Uh, so, I mean, it, it was uh, tricky, <laughs> tricky all the time. And also Nicolas mentioned that if the, there is some food labeled by, by European community, what to do about it. Uh, but I think that this pragmatic, pragmatic approach and respect for, for different opinions. What was the answer behind the, the, the success? Yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. And um, yeah, there's probably not the, not the one answer, not the one one magic solution, but it's a it's a continuous struggle with and with the right attitude that you that you just mentioned, I guess. And uh, can I just add one thing? There were there was one British guy I interviewed him sometime, and he also wrote a very good good thing in ninety five or something like that about the Bosnia, and he wa was attending a. a or, or giving a lecture at some meeting in London is called Lee Bryant. And at this meeting in springtime 93, there came a lot of left wing activists. And he was explaining that he saw this war going on in Bosnia, and especially uh, the, the defense of Tuzla as uh, compared to the Spanish civil war. Uh, as an anti-fascist struggle, and all these uh, people from different uh, small left-wing groups in, in, in UK. And he said to them, that, okay, you can discuss different theories and things like that, but you should also do something about the conflict going on in Tuzla and Bosnia and support the trade unions. And I think it, it was, he said that some of the people attending this meeting, they, they were part of this first campaign in UK, the work is aid for Bosnia. So, so it was about making analysis and also doing something practical. Yeah, thanks a lot. We, we also have questions in the, in the Q&A and I will now hand over to Alexandra, who will share them with us. 
And yeah, from now on, um, feel all welcome um, yeah, to answer to these questions um, as you see fit and as you, as you would like. Thank you. And if anyone uh, wants to ask the question, as Axel said before, it's also possible, so just raise your hand. Um, I would first like to read a comment before asking a question uh, from Jasmina. And she's saying, I would um, say that in Tusla, the international workers' le legacy and the memory of its solidarity work is quite strong and rather well known amongst both the activist scene and ordinary citizens. I'm proud to have known them back in the 90s where many of us worked and resisted the war in an internationalist, anti-fascist and socialist manner. It was a huge pleasure and a testament to the politics we share to have seen some of the activists joining the Tusla Plenum in 2014. Solidarity is still there. Then uh, one question from uh, Vicky from Germany. Did you have any fears and concerns when you first started this initiative? And which uh, were they concretely? You know, you are going into a war zone. What made you still want to um, actively help in Tuzla, which I know was more than just bringing and delivering food? Thank you. Who wants to answer first? Yeah, Francisca, thank you. Um, uh, I think also we have to say that in many in many ways we were also pretty blue eyed. I mean, huh? we all had never been in a war zone and we didn't know what it meant. Um, and I remember also uh, when we first were there, it was probably it was hard for example for for robert who we were staying with who we were renting a room with i mean with you know and then also maybe a bit the some also bosnian macho attitude it was a bit hard for him seeing uh, young girls walking around in Tuzla <laughs> and saying this is not a mountain in switzerland you're walking through a war zone huh? um so of course but i also i also don't think that we acted too um, irresponsible um, and um, uh, but of course when we were there then we then you also understood more what it really meant to be there um, um, but at the same time because we were so attached to to the people it you know it then felt better to still be there with them than to be outside <laughs> and you know that was hard then and then I don't know, that's uh, maybe an opinion others share um, as well. I mean, for me, it was anyway, then even when having been there, I mean, war is really, it's, a, it's just totally sick. And <laughs> uh, it's like very strange that like, or for me, it was like whenever you, you when you left, um, even if you were like more or less next door to the where the war was actually happening, you still can't imagine a war being there because it's just it's it's sick as such. Um, yeah, but I think it was yeah was a, a combination and then just really being focused on what we wanted to do and um, not thinking very much uh, about uh, what could have happened. And uh, as for me, I can also say I <laughs> didn't understand until much later, for example, um, I didn't think at all also for what it meant, for example, for my parents or whatever. And I'm very grateful afterwards that, you know, that they, they didn't put their fears in my way, but kept them for themselves. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Anyone else wants to answer the same question? Yeah, Laila, please. Uh, it was great to see young people 
coming to Tuzla, to the war zone, to support us. At that time, we had already, huh, let's say, too many uh, international humanitarian organizations, but they were not listening to us. They were bringing food to refugees. We were living in our town. Uh, we didn't leave the town. We were not refugees. We were not allowed to have that uh, humanitarian aid. And we were suffering a lot. And uh, to have that people besides us, uh, with us, uh, who were listening to us, supporting us, talking with us, that was a really great thing. Uh, they were all young, but I remember that my parents were also taking care of them, trying to take care of them. Francisca remembers some things about wet ha hair um, or some other things. Uh, uh, we were trying, uh, or they allowed us, IWA allowed us to be on the same level as they are. They accepted us as we are. And uh, thank you guys for that. Uh, you didn't make any difference between you, us, them. We were all together. Uh, and we supported each other, I think, at the same time. Uh, it was a great pleasure to share that life with them. And uh, I know that uh, besides what they did for us, uh, that we have friends always that will support us, think of us, be with us. And I will be always there for you as well. Thank you. It's really difficult to, to speak after you because everything then sounds so trivial in comparison. Uh, but Ulf, you also want to add something? Yes. Uh... I can't find my my raise the hand button. Uh, this question about fear. I think that during the war, we, I mean, in Stockholm, we used to have weekly meetings, and of course, we were always a bit afraid when we had people going on convoys from Makarska in Croatia up to Tuzla. And when we had people at the Tuzla office from 94 and further on. And I mean, we didn't have any, any real policy if something serious would happen to people from IWA, what could we do? I mean, we were under the umbrella of United Nations. So at least people had some protection that they had the right to be evacuated from Tuzla in case of emergency or something like that. And now when you look back to this, this uh, the, the, the years of war, I mean, we were quite lucky that, that nothing serious happened uh, but I think Nicholas is mentioning in the book that two of our, our tracks were lost at Igman Mountain outside Sarajevo in 95 and uh, no, no, in the end of 94. Uh, and one of them was hijacked by the Bosnian army. So suddenly we were out of tracks, but, but the drivers were, were safe. And I just remember now when there was the ceasefire from January 95 until uh, April or May 95, uh, there was one serious shelling from the Bosnian Serbian army against Tuzla, and a lot of soldiers were killed in March 95 or something like that. And when you hear this news and you know that we have people in Tuzla at that time, of course, we we would fear for for their safety, and, and I mean, uh, of course, it, it's not you can. It's difficult to compare if you're living 
all the time in the war zone if or if you are going there for a mission and staying one month or or a few weeks or something like that but but we had the, this uh, this feeling that that it's also about the safety for iw activists who doesn't ha have a, a yeah, I don't remember if people had a proper insurance for going to a war zone. Thank you very much. Uh, there's one person from the audience, very patient for quite a long time, uh, Roland from London. I would like to invite you to ask your question. Uh uh, I'm Roland in London. I was involved in Workers' Aid for Bosnia and then IWA from the beginning. Uh, I've just had a chance to download the book and glance through it. Uh, and I mean, for a start, I have to say, Nicholas, I think that your um, account of the separation between IWA and Workers' Aid is slightly inaccurate. It's not really the time to go into it now, but it doesn't um, chime with, with my recollection of the events. But I want to say, because it's absolutely right what I think you, you say this in the book, and um, I think authors referred to it, this actually stymied the work of IWA in Britain, having two rival campaigns. And at the time, the political issues that divided us seemed, and they were really important. But at the same time, the things that, that we were agreed on that separated us from much of the rest of the left in Britain were much more important. And a particular story I have to tell about this is that soon afterwards, I was invited to a meeting of the Jewish Socialists Group in London. They were considering doing some work, some solidarity work on Bosnia. One of their leading members, Charlie Pottins, was a member of Workers' Aid for Bosnia. And they wanted to hear both the arguments for both campaigns before they decided how to work and what to do. So I went along to the meeting, Charlie went there, we both prepared speeches about our relative campaigns, and before either of us could speak, somebody from the audience raised a whole set of issues about support for Serbia and why the Jewish Socialist Group shouldn't be involved in support for Bosnia at all and Muslim fundamentalism and all sorts of nonsense like this. And it turned out that having gone to this meeting, uh, in order to argue against each other, Charlie from Works Over Bosnia and I um, united to argue the case for solidarity with Bosnia as a whole. Uh, and I, mean, I think there's an important lesson to learn that the, the difference is the difference on open the northern route, the difference on how the relative autonomy of the local campaigns, the, the difference on how you relate to um, the communities in Bosnia were important. But I think that to an extent we lost sight of a much more important thing, which was that we were, we were confronting most of the left who didn't want to support Bosnia at all. And I think we've seen this in subsequent campaigns um, and in, our, in other areas as well. Uh, I mean, I think that there, there is a lesson that we all need to learn from this about remembering what are the essentials. And just one small point that I want to make, by the way, I don't know what's happening in other countries in Europe, but in Britain over the past year, there's been the development of a whole network of mutual support organizations for people who are involved in lockdown and affected by coronavirus. And many of us who've been involved in this have been trying to take in to these campaigns the message of solidarity, not charity. And I think that this is actually a lesson again that we've learned from the IWA campaign, that there, there is a way in which um, mutual aid and mutual support and um, um, mutual solidarity uh, can, be, can be developed, can be expressed without coming over as uh, and this, I mean, I think Francesca spoke very well about this, but this is something I think that we've all learned from the IWA campaign, that um, we're, our solidarity is not because we're benefactors coming to help you feel better, but your struggle is our struggle, I think is a lesson that we all have to learn from this. Thank you very much. Yeah, Nicolas? Yeah, perhaps uh, just to react. Um, thank you, Roland. I mean, we didn't have an uh, opportunity to, to speak yet. I mean, uh, I hope we will 
uh, can continue. And I'm glad that you disagree uh, with uh, what I'm writing. Uh, because, I mean, of course, it's um, as a historian, I was not there. Yeah. So I read the sources, I spoke with some persons, not everybody. So I have my interpretation, but I, um, and um, uh, so, I, and of course, the perspective of a historian is a different one than from somebody who is involved. But I think that would be a, a great conversation to continue to, to also to see these different perspectives. I think it would go too far now in this circle because it would go too, too much in the specifics. But I'm glad that you say that you don't agree with uh, uh, some interpretation I give uh, because that uh, could really be a, a good basis for, for more discussion. So I hope, Roland, that we will have the opportunity uh, to, to talk more. Uh, now that the, the contact is established here also. And uh, yeah, once that you, you had read the, uh, the entire book also to, to speak about that, yeah. But once again, I think this was also for me as a historian, um, once again, uh, yeah, to reconstruct from the, from the documents um, and speaking, when I spoke, I spoke, I think with, I made interviews with approximately 12 persons, former persons from International Workers Aid. And of course, everybody has his or her own uh, perspective on it. And um, uh, for me, this was also fascinating, of course, then to try to put the puzzle together yeah? and to confront it also with the documents, yeah? to have the documents, because also the documents are not telling everything. So yeah, so just this as a, as a fast answer, as an invitation for further uh, discussion about that. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's important what Roland is saying, but I mean, the main reason for, for the split in 93 between Workers Aid for Bosnia and what became International Workers Aid, it, it was this meeting in Manchester, and I see that Soren Sundegaard from, from Denmark is participating. And Soren and I, we were both present at this meeting. And I mean, it was really sad, but if we hadn't split, uh, then, I mean, for Workers Aid for Bosnia at that time, it was more about making propaganda against United Nations saying that they should open this northern corridor from Sopanja in Croatia through the Brechko corridor down to Tuzla. It was uh, logical for, if you look at the map, but uh, at political military way, it was crazy because the uh, United Nations had no idea of, of uh, creating a war zone to help uh, these trucks delivering aid to Tuzla. So it was really sad, but, but I think it was important to hear Roland's uh, comments. Thanks. Thank you. Of course, disagreement is also welcome. Um, there's another question, uh, Jasmina. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Hi. Uh, my question, well, I have lots of questions, but I will actually uh, keep it brief. I was also very touched by some uh, moments here, like Leila, especially because uh, we all worked together, uh, I think, in, back in 93 and 94, especially uh, cons considering the um, true projects that we had, uh, and we had strong cooperation with IWA, I worked for Oxfam, but I also was an activist in the local Red Lily organization of young girls. So um, there was quite a lot of work together back in 93 and 94. So I have, uh, uh, I think that International Workers Aid, in terms of how it operated in the field was an exception, comp comp uh, considering the politics of humanitarian aid in Bosnia and how it operated as much as Tuzla was exception in all sorts of ways from, uh, from the ways in which the war was waged elsewhere, especially uh, 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 or from the defense itself, from the way the city operated, etc. So 
it, it is kind of quite complex to explain this whole story, I understand it fully, because it completely undermines the dominant and everyday narratives of what was going on here locally. Um, so, so that was just a brief uh, uh, interlude. My key question is, what are your plans about uh, promoting um, this book in Tuzla and organizing um, public classrooms or events around that, because I think that it is really prescient and it's really the right time for uh, the community in Tuzla to uh, kind of revisit these um, uh, emancipatory episodes from its 92 to 95 period, which we often for forget as much as the international community um, uh, is forget forgetting as well. Um, considering that, uh, well, especially because I think that in, uh, I'm not surprised that Nicholas never heard from IW, uh, about IWA for me, you know, to, in Tuzla, it's kind of funny that somebody would not hear about that. But it also explains how different our local histories are in the 1990s between Tuzla and Sarev or Tuzla and Mostar and other parts, because you know, there was, you know, we were all like in mini zones, yet still connected somehow, somehow by the life story. So um, that is my question. What are the plans for the local debate around these issues? And uh, uh, thank you. And thank you, Nicolas, and thank you, um, Rosa Luxemburg Kipton, for uh, uh, for making this book happen. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your comments and your question. Who would like to react? Yeah, Laila, please. Yeah, I, I agree with Yasmina as well. Uh, I mean, it's very important, especially in those days that we discuss about things like uh, solidarity and the, about the war mm -hmm. in Bosnia and Herzegovina and how uh, IWA helped us during that period and what solidarity is. And uh, I think that uh, we should somehow organize it, Yasmina, maybe here in Tuzla, to talk with the uh, people in um, municipality or somewhere else to see uh, university as well. University that's more important maybe uh, because uh, it's very important that young people learn uh, what the war is, what solidarity is, how we can help each other, not only in the war zones, how we can help each other in uh, everyday life, you know, it's, uh, it happened that we had war. It happened that we needed help and thank, uh, thanks to IWA, we had it. But it's also very important to learn our young persons that we have to be uh, 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 solidar with other people, not only in Bosnia. Uh, we had that help from abroad. Maybe we can help somewhere else. It's not the end. We got help. We have to help other. Let's share it. Let's share love. Thanks. Sorry, Yasmina. No, yes, I, I agree with that. I think it's very important. This is kind of often forgotten that the UNHCR official policy in Tula was not to give this people. There were very few uh, organizations that made an exception, and uh, IWA was one of them. Uh, and hence, the, you know, hence the importance that why they stood out, and why they are remembered as well so strongly because of this kind of uh, solidarity that was um, because there was a big problem. It created a huge rift between refugees and local people. Here, that kind of unity or policy that was operative in the period between 92 and 95, which was not the case in Sarajevo because in Sarajevo they helped everyone. But for you know, for Tuzla, for reasons unknown, they were only uh, giving aid to um, refugees. So, um, well, so I, I just wanted to actually uh, uh, mention another reason why why it is 
uh, you know, more well known in Tuzla than in other parts of Bosnia and the whole effort because of this, uh, because of, of this key gesture. And especially the workers, but in Tuzla, helping the workers or helping the justice union means helping a significant chunk of town, considering the number of people who were employed by Kreta back in the 1990s. I think it had like you know, 10,000 employees. That means you know, if you help you know, several thousand uh, people, that means you know, mean a lot of families in Tuzla. It's kind of. Yes, thank you, Yasmina. I think, uh, Nicolas, you raised your hand. Yeah. No, I mean, concerning the succession. Um, uh, what you said, uh, Yasmin, I mean, I hope that, um, um, I mean, for me, as who has written the book, uh, that's just mm -hmm. the first, the, it's just the first step to have written the book. Uh, now the book uh, is alive, and now the book should get a life by its own, and hopefully, yeah, um, can trigger some discussions like now. Uh, so, I mean, I would be very happy, of course, to come to Tuzla. I think it would be important, of course, to talk also here in Sarajevo and other parts about Bosnia and Herzegovina, because as you said, there's this so strong local zones experiences, which often ignore what happened in other parts of Bosnia and Herzegovina. I'm happy when I'm in Germany or France or wherever when to do something there. So I mean, the advantage of International Workers Aid that you have former activists in each country in nearly of Europe. So actually it will could be quite easy to organize uh, uh, also some events in whatever. I mean, of course, with Corona now, it's more complicated, but uh, it can be online, it can be uh, physically. I mean, I think anyway, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation plans to do something in Tuzla for sure. Um, but I think there are many things to be invented. And I think this format also here to have really persons who were involved uh, and in the same time, um, uh, to talk about that and as you said and especially to raise so to learn about uh, this story but to raise the questions yeah for today what can we do uh, for today and it's just perhaps to share one other experience from international workers aid because what you just said leila how can we share what we experienced uh, with others i mean there was this attempt during the kosovo war where actually um especially um uh, different persons from eva wanted to launch uh, a, a convoy from Tuzla to Mitrovica, yeah, because they said also, especially in the Kosovo war, to share the experience from Tuzla uh, in Mitrovica, actually it was before the war started, because when it became possible, to share this experience could be super interesting, and several persons, uh, also the municipality and trade union said, yes, uh, we also want uh, that could be a great idea. I mean, when there were a lot of difficulties, finally it doesn't take place, but it was, at the beginning, it was the same idea. How also, as you said, how can what we um, shared, or we experienced some solidarity from others, so how, what can we do now, perhaps to share it with the persons in Kosovo, yeah? Or, as you, so this was a question in 1998, but as you say, for today, it's the question, what can we do today uh, to, um, to, to practice solidarity uh, in our neighborhood, with our countries, within our society. And I think, uh, yeah, this, the story of International Workers Aid is, can really be a good trigger to, uh, for these kind of questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, we'd actually also like to give our colleague um, from our Tuzla office uh, the word in a minute to react to that as well. Um, looking at the time, uh, somebody asked in the, in the, in the Q&A section if there is a time limit. Um, unfortunately, yes, we have a time limit. I think we could um, continue um, talking for hours. I still have a couple of questions um, in the back of my head that I'd like to ask. But um, yeah, I suggest that we um, try to close within the next um, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, still, we have Hans Peter and Marlene in um, the participants list to raise their hand and would like um, to share a word. Then we have our colleague from the Tuzla office and then still a question in the in the Q&A. So with these uh, three contributions, um, I would leave it close to Q&A now. 
Um, yeah, and give the word to give the word to um, Hans Peter and Valin. Okay, hello. <laughs> I'm 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 a bit abroad. I'm occupied with other things. I just uh, join your meeting, and I don't have too many things about uh, like balancing and so to say. I just I just uh, I'm, I'm proud proud to having been a member of this uh, organization, and um, I just listen to your balancing, and this, it's quite interesting. But I have no idea of, of any future common work, so I'm just a spectator. Yeah, that's all I have to say. And Marlin is in the kitchen, unfortunately. Hey, thank you very much. <laughs> all right, then. I would hand over the word to our colleague Emin from uh, the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung's office in Tuzla. So, welcome, Emin. Uh, yes, can everyone hear me? Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for uh, this very, very interesting discussion and. Nicholas, I'm very much looking forward to reading the book in detail and um, learning a bit about it because the first time I heard of Workers Aid was was some three years ago. I think I think um, from from our colleague Andreas um, with regards to promoting uh, promoting this whole story of international workers aid and in Tuzla and during during the war, uh, we actually did plan for our office opening event in September, hopefully, if the pandemic permits, uh, to have a program point and Andreas is also invited as a, as a speaker on, on, on that. So I think it's going to be on September 4th. Um, I will of course, uh, notify all the colleagues if if it will be recorded, if it'll be up up on YouTube. It's going to be a bit of a closed event because of the pandemic, and uh, yeah. But uh, this could be, this could be a kickoff, and uh, definitely, I I also have personally interest in in uh, continue continuing talking about uh, international workers' aid and in, in the future work that we do here at the office. So, um, yeah, that's basically it. Great, thank you, Emin. Um, maybe you can um, share in the chat uh, your email address if you'd like, um, or other ways of uh, contact or, or to follow you and the RLS Tuzla office. Um, that would be great. There you go. Okay. Great. Then, um, yeah, it's almost um, almost a closing question. Um, we have two questions that are to a certain extent similar. I would like to combine them with one question from Yannick Dupont, um, who is actually asking Ulf, uh, saying that today the same left divisions uh, exist on Syria with uh, significant parts of the left defending Assad and how to mobilize the left against um, for the real victims uh, in Syria and counter this intra left division. Um, but this is not exactly related. Um, International Workers Aid, and we have another question that is um, that is focusing more on, on our today's discussion. I would like to, um, yeah, well, we can't put these questions together, um, but focus on the second question that we actually have in the chat, um, which is asked by Ina, and I think it's a good um, good way to close also for tonight. Um, Ina is our uh, thanking for for this talk. And the question is, do any of you old um, IWA activists have ideas of how we can use the experiences today? There are horribly many protracted uh, conflicts around the world, but most are not in Europe. Um, have you had any thoughts on how to use the International Workers' Aid experience and solidarity work um, with, for example, Palestine? Um, but I've also asked myself this question looking at other conflicts that we that we have um, outside of Europe, um, what is your take on it or what are your thoughts on um, on on using the international workers aid experience 
um, for thinking about what we can do in these regards. Um, so I might, um, yeah, I'll suggest that we do a round um, with you, of, uh, Francisca and Leila on this, um, if you'd like to share your thoughts on that. Um, if not, um, just feel free um, to share any closing words you'd like. Um, yeah, please be brief in your reply um, so that we can end uh, shortly. Any volunteers? Anyone you'd like to start? Yes, Ulf. Um, yeah, of course, you, you can learn from IWA in certain aspects if you want to organize solidarity work. But, but I think it's difficult to, to just copy our work because every conflict ha has its own background and its own problems and and what was for us unique with Tusla was that we had I mean we were a grassroots movement in Europe and many had experiences from trade union work so it was quite easy to relate to 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 our partner in Tusla the the the, the trade unions the miners trade union and if you take other conflicts like uh, like uh, Syria, of course you should support the real victims. Uh, and uh, I agree with Yannick that it's a tricky question about uh, the, the left wing stand or about Syria. But the, I mean, we had other conflicts in, in Europe. Yeah, we have uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, over Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, we have the conflicts in Georgia. We have the frozen conflict in Moldova, Transnistria, and it's difficult to, or, or now the, the ongoing tragedy with Israel, Palestine, but it, it's difficult to just copy IWA. I, I think it's impossible, but of course, if you are active in solidarity work in, in other regions, you, you can learn from what we did. So, so that that's, uh, that's my answer. Thank you. Yes, Francisca. Um, also, yeah, I agree with Ulf that it's not possible or that's also not at all the issue or what a book would want to do like this. It's really not about copying it, but it is maybe, it is maybe an example that um, that can be that can give hope to other initiatives or other sparks that actually also with very limited resources quite many things are possible um, and um, yeah I also don't have you know there is enough conflicts and it's also always uh, coincidences that have to come together to give like you know the basis of any campaign um, uh, I, I, I also wouldn't know really where or, or how to start. Um, um, there was something else I wanted to say. I don't, uh, yeah, and uh, just about, yeah, also, I also liked what, um, what Nicolas said, you know, this, this book can be put alive. It can be, you know, it can be a tool also, you know, to, to open, discussions also with a relation to conflicts that are happening today. And then maybe, you know, maybe something will grow out of it or not. We all don't know, but it's just the, the beginning. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Francisca. And thank you for this, uh, for this outlook and um, for this idea as well. Leila, then yeah, it's up to you for, uh, for a final word, if you like. Just the final word. Uh, I just want to say thanks to all of you for organizing this, this for writing the book. And first of all, thanks to all IWA uh, members, all the people who supported Bosnia and Herzegovina, who supported trade union in uh, Tuzla, who supported students. Unfortunately, Francisca, we didn't mention the woman that we supported here in Tuzla and we are 
strong woman and uh, we can do a lot of a lot of it and we show that we we really are strong uh you know that my doors are always open tuzla is uh, will always welcome you you're always welcome to tuzla please come and please also bring your kids and tell them what you did explain to them what happened try to uh talk with them about the situation maybe about the war somewhere else. You have experience. You can explain to them what happened. Uh, let's learn them to be better people. Let's be better people. Thank you very much. And cheers with Tuzlansko. Ciao. Thank you very much, Leila. Thank you very much. We couldn't uh, we couldn't find better um, better closing words um, than yours. Um, I just realized there is um, there is a question from or a statement from Ulrich Hohl and um, Ulrich uh, um, wasn't on this panel, but um, yeah, Alexandra um, yeah discovered his, his message. Uh, we discovered his message in the in the Q and A, and we'll. Um, we'll share it with us and then, then we close. Thank you. Ulrich, I don't know if you don't to if you want to talk, otherwise I would just read it. Okay. Um, I think I'm a very strong motivating factor for international workers' aid activists was the very powerful reality of experiencing Tusla as an anti-fascist city a city with its own rich history of practicing solidarity, uh, where the legislature felt very much alive. And not just that, um, Tuzla's solidarity with the British miner strike, etc. It was a very inspiring and positive atmosphere, despite the dreadful war situation. I remember Tuzla miner saying, we see what you people are doing. It's like when we were kids, we collected help for the Vietnamese. Thank you for your contribution, Ulrich. And yeah, at this point also a big thank you to all our participants um, for staying. Now we took almost two hours um, to exchange with each other. Thank you very much for joining us tonight, for staying with us. Um, a big thank you um, to all our speakers, um, to Nicolas, to Ulf, to Francisca, to Leila for joining us tonight. And um, for me personally, it was really enriching. I, I read Nicola's study, um, but talking with you tonight, actually, I think I, I understood much more about what IWA was actually about. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, I, feel, I feel enriched now. So thanks a lot for that. Um, I hope some others uh, have the same feeling after our event tonight. Um, yeah, stay tuned um, for um, the event of our Tuzla office um share here again the link um to the study once more and yes have a great evening everybody thank you very much for joining and see you hopefully at another event soon bye bye thank you also very much for organizing sure